Episode 159 of The Tech Informist is here. Let's begin. Welcome, everyone, to 2017 and to the Tech Informist podcast. I'm Kevin. I'm Brad. And we're going to be talking about CES because that is the big story of this week. So no standard, typical news stories, just CES, all episode, along with our app and entertainment picks and following up with our beer pick of the week. First up for CES 2017, we are going to talk about Razer. So Razer Project Valerie, that's kind of the first thing that stood out to us from Razer because they've made a few different announcements. We get a couple stories from Razer about here. This is really wild, and I can definitely see this being something for software developers because it's got three displays on, on a, a laptop. laptop. Now, a lot of you are very familiar with the Razer Blade Stealth or Razer Blade Pro that they just showed off at the end of last year. And going into the new year, obviously, they have to one-up themselves. I mean, they tend to do this, it feels like, every year now. And <laughs> this is a laptop that there's one screen and then it comes out and then there's three screens because there's two separate ones, one to the left, one to the right. It's all automatic, automated and they're all 4K, three 4K screens, which effectively makes it 12K, as somebody was saying, I guess. <laughs> Could I, be. I, don't know. I, I mean, as rendering for the graphics card. So the only way to render that is by the the new NVIDIA 1080, I believe. And that's what's power. Yeah, the, the GeForce GTX 1080 graphics card yeah, which with is... NVIDIA G-Sync for those great – Frames per second. Right. And that's the current top of the line for laptops. So it's super, super high powerful. And this is what, by default, it's a 17-inch display by itself. This Project Valerie, I've, I kind of look at this kind of like a concept car. It's exactly. It's just one of those things that, hey, we can do it. We're not really going to, like, make this, but we can do it. We've never seen anything like this before. No. And so to we'll, see it for the first time, it's like, holy crap, this is real. This could actually happen. For instance, we'll – show you something later in the episode that would even, I think, push this forward even more. On CNET, they've got a nice little video there because, unfortunately, we didn't get to go to CES 2017. One of these years. Yeah, that would be actually pretty nice to do. And looking at this video, I mean, he's playing a first-person shooter, which obviously, you, when you think Razer, you think of gaming. But again, like I said, I think software developers would really be able to do a lot with this, or people that are editing video. And oh, yeah. I would feel just at home in, in three monitors. I, I have two at home, and it's great. I could only imagine what three would be like. Everywhere. Everywhere you go, you could have three. That's amazing. Yeah, it's pretty wild because it looks like it has a built-in kind of trackpad, which is off to the right, it looks like. Assuming and guessing here. So for somebody like me who just loves their mice, if you don't have that as an option, it would still feel as though you sort of did. Just mm -hmm. a guess. Yeah, so this Project Valerie, one and a half inches thick and weighs around 12 pounds. So it's not really something <laughs> you're going to want to be lugging around. Well, it's better than lugging around a 35-pound tower that I have at home. That's true, and multiple monitors and yeah. cables and mm -hmm. yada, yada, yada. So, ah, man, again, I don't think this is going to be something that is going to be released to the mass public. But, man, that would be pretty wild if they did. Uh, give it five years. I'd say give it five years. That'd be enough to get it cheaper and lighter and more into the masses. Because like you said, at 12 pounds, it's not really ideal. I would no. say somewhere closer to five pounds, six pounds, I think people could tolerate it more. Yeah. It's really cool to look at. <laughs> it, it's but, uh, kind of amazing. Yeah. I personally don't think I'd have a use for it. But I know there is that niche crowd out there that would be salivating at yeah. the opportunity. When's the pre-orders? When's the pre-order? I need uh -huh. to pre-order this thing. And Yeah, definitely go check out the video in the show notes because it's really kind of something to behold. Pretty much everything that we do talk about on here is going to have a link to it in the show notes in case you missed it. Next up from Razer, we have the 
Ariana projection concept. This really jumped out at me. I don't know if you remember a couple years back. It might have even been before the Xbox One. But it was a collaboration between Microsoft and Samsung. They had done something similar to that. A Lumi Room or something right like that. Possibly. And I, I think we might have even talked about it on an episode at one point. It was essentially this. And it was just sort of a concept, kind of an idea of like what we can do with the technology we have to kind of make yourself more immersed. And it turns out Razer kind of just went ahead and did it. Yeah, so Razer's just kind of like going all in with all these crazy and somewhat wild off-the-wall ideas. And here's another technical concept, Project Ariana. And what this is, it's just, what, a 4K projector that has got some gaming internals in there? What do we got here? Yeah, so essentially it's a projector, but it says something about a 720p resolution limit for the screen. So you'll be focusing more on your actual screen in front of you versus the stuff in the wall. So the wall stuff is supposed to be like your peripherals. It just maybe give you like a better visual sight of what's around you if you're playing like let's say a first person shooter. So it's really going to be interesting for the people that are sitting in the room with you while you're using and uh -huh. playing on this thing. I can't see this actually working in my office at home, but maybe behind my TV or something at home in the living room area. I think that would be a better place for it, but definitely not in my office. This little projector pushes a 4K picture to the wall split between the TV and the projector. Projector and TV are both 4K, but the TV only displays a 720p image. While the projector blasts out the remaining pixels the connected computer was processing. I wouldn't say it's kind of Wally-esque, but it's kind of like a... It looks like Eve in Wally. White. It's got the one big lens, obviously, so it kind of gives that Cyclops effect. But I like the design, the the visuals of this thing. It would definitely tie in nicely with my tower. Mm, oh, yeah. Being a white tower, this is all nice and white and whites and blacks and I stuff I would imagine like that. they would have a couple different colors. That's just kind of how Razer is. You know, they, mm -hmm. they definitely push that color boundary. Asus, another popular name at CES. And you have kind of been a fan of the Asus phones. You've never had one. True. I, I love the idea. But you the love idea. the idea and yeah. the look because they seem to kind of – I don't know if this is where I would throw in the innovate word or not because we still haven't bought a Zen phone even though we like what it is that Asus is doing. My Asus love kind of stems from my tower. I would say 70% of my components are Asus, and they have not failed me. That tower is – I built it in 2012, so it's a little a little old now. And Coming into its fifth year. Yeah. And that's another thing too. It's when you think about, man, 2017, and then you build that in 2012. It's like, man, that's a four- or five-year-old tower now. Man, it's almost time to upgrade again. <laughs> Next year. <laughs> Hopefully. It's 2018 is what you're looking for? Hopefully. We'll Hopefully. see. We'll see how things roll. So Asus has came out with the Zenfone AR. This is going to have Tango and Daydream being built into the same device where like the Pixel phone and the Pixel XL can only do Daydream. This is going to be able to do both Tango and Daydream in a single device. It's kind of impressive and interesting. Have we had a phone that's been able to do that yet? So to I do both? No. I can't think of one offhand. And really, it's one or the other. And again, Lenovo is the only one that has actually released a Tango sensor phone. And ah. that was, again, a 6.4-inch body. You kind of need that giant body for that giant sensor, I guess. Yeah. Uh, the Zenfone AR slims things down a little bit to 5.7, which is a little bit more familiar to people you know, with iPhones and Samsungs and things like that. And again... A lot of people still are not completely sold on the bigger is better aspect in smartphones. I am, so that's – I'm all about bigger is better with that. Although I feel anything above that like 5, 7, 5, 8 just gets to be too much. You're like teetering on the extreme edge yeah. there, folks. Yeah. With the Zenfone AR, you get a motion tracking camera, fish eye depth sensing camera, as well as the standard – 23 megapixel Sony IMX 318 camera sensor. Fantastic. Right, which is actually slightly more megapixels than what Lenovo offered in the Fab 2 Pro. 
but it's going to be really good to see how this does in low light. Resolution is 2560 by 1440. Is that 2K? or? Yeah, it's definitely not a quad HD or anything like no, that. No, but it, it does support a Snapdragon 821 with 6 gigs of RAM. Yeah, I was kind of hoping they, since Snapdragon and Qualcomm have released the 835, I was kind of hoping that this would have an 835 in it, honestly. Yes, but I think because this phone is already made, they there's no way to put that in there. Right. Uh, whereas, like, LG has not shown their phone yet, and that could very well have that 835. Mm-hmm. So maybe Asus will do a Zenfone AR2. And Remix. they would have the <laughs> Snapdragon 835 in it because we're going to talk a little bit more about Qualcomm and the Snapdragon 835 a little bit later in the fact that it is intended for this world of virtual and augmented reality devices. Looking forward to this, and then again, Asus also came out with the Zenfone 3 Zoom. So these companies are getting pretty silly with their names. They're getting long. They are. Long names. So you just make sure you're not like getting all tongue-tied saying the Asus Zenfone 3 Zoom. Mm. And how about this? A 5,000 milliamp hour battery. I want it. I'm good. Let's do this. With a dual camera. Yep. How about that? And and you look at some of the images you've got on the back. You've got the fingerprint sensor right there, kind of like where it, with the Nexus 6P. Aesthetically, it's very iPhone-esque. Whoa, whoa. You went there, didn't you? But <laughs> it has the fingerprint reader on the back like exactly. LG. Right. So it, it's like you kind of slam the two together. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Kind of interesting. And the... Images that have kind of come out, they show kind of like a coral pink, rose gold, silver, yeah, yeah, whatever, and a nice black slab. It's packing a pair of 12 megapixel sensors, one that's got a 25 millimeter wide angle lens, and one with a 56 millimeter lens that offers a 2.3 times optical zoom. So I know, Brad, you're kind of a fan of your dual camera sensors. I love it so much. I don't know if this is actually going to be considered a negative. It's going to depend on who you are. If you really want a powerhouse of a phone, you might be a little disappointed to know that it's going to have a Snapdragon 625 in it. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm the 625 isn't too far behind the 8. Now with their new numbering system, I can't remember. Yeah, it's like they go all over the place. This yeah. is kind of like their mid-level, right, mid-range right. kind so of stuff. But it not could terrible. be optimized good. Right, not terrible, but uh, could have could have used an 820 maybe. But then thinking, thinking again, I mean with a 625 and a 5,000 milliamp hour battery, nice you're battery probably going to get some good battery life with this device. At least on paper. At least on paper. <laughs> Real world usage may different i think it would be something i'd like to try i mean it's five inch range it also is sporting a a 1.7 aperture which for those of you who have your samsung devices is amazing for Mm -hmm. low lights typically um i'm part of that software but i would really really like to see this thing kind of battle it out for some low lights so iphone 7 is a 1.8 aperture so is my LG. And Apple's optical zoom is limited to 2x, more as this is going to have the 2.3 time the optical <laughs> zoom. Yeah, and there, that's that's what we're going to – this is going to be a stair-step effect. Just like when we started out with, you know, oh, my camera's got a – it's a 2.0 megapixel. And then the next year it's like it's 3.2. And it, yeah, and it, it just – it's a stair-step effect. Mm-hmm. This is inevitable. This will keep going forward like this. All right. So you'll actually be able to look for this phone in February, launching with Marshmallow. So not quite nougat yet. Yeah. I mean, to be in the price range that usually they look at for these phones, I guess you kind of have to launch with all of those things. Yeah. So more details on launch date, which carriers and stuff, and where you're actually going to be able to get this thing. So... Obviously, you don't see a whole lot of Asus phones in the United States. Maybe they'll start making some releases here. All right, now it's time to talk about some of the big, big 
big names that always have these humongous displays and big old monster sections there at CES. And, oh, my gosh, I still remember walking into the LG and the Samsung areas, and it's like, oh, my God, look at all of this. I can only imagine. It's so funny, too, because they both come from the same country. Yeah. It, it, just amazing to think about the kind of money that is spent on CES and their presentations to get the word out about what it is they're doing. I mean, that is their E3. Like, this is yes. this is when guns come ablazing, you know, that this is when they bring out the, the heavy artillery and LG did this year. My God. Oh, yeah. He is chomping at the bit oh, to talk about this little new I, 4K OLED. I just TV. so happened to be on Instagram. I just woke up, uh, I would say, two days ago. Uh, Android Central went live with one of their feeds, and they were doing the LG press event. And I was like, oh, I've got time to watch that. So I kind of sat down and started watching it because, you know, I, I like LG. I like what they're kind of doing, trying to innovate. I, you Life's know, they, good. They, yeah. <laughs> they tried to innovate with the LG G5. It didn't go over like we had hoped. I mean, that's what happens when you innovate. Sometimes it catches, sometimes it don't. Right. And that's fine. But they keep trying. And not only did they try this year, but I truly believe they came out with the flagship TV that will take over what your TV will look like from go going forward. The future this, of televisions so, for the immediate future. Right. So you, you think of you know TVs going from black and white to color to right before HD TV to near flat panels and yeah, CRTs plasmas. and projection and DLP. And, and, and they just get thinner and thinner. Well, there's a point where thin is a problem. Because you still got all this other hardware that goes inside exactly. the television. Exactly. Now. With, well, now with OLED, and this is apparently this is only possible with OLED TV. I don't know how real or whatever that is, but I'll, let's, let's roll with it. This TV is two point, what is it, five? Two point seven millimeters thick. Yeah, that that's one tenth of an inch thick. I actually know two point five seven millimeters thick, so even less, so closer to what you had said. Yeah, so is one tenth of an inch thick. So you could imagine that this TV needs to be flexible. It is, and you would imagine that this TV is light for its size. It is, it is. at sixteen pounds for a sixty-five inch that they are showing off. Essentially, you mount magnets on the wall and you slap it to the magnets. Now, this is something we were talking about last year, mm -hmm. where they they had this TV that you basically slap on the wall. Here it is. All right. I mean, it's not flexible in the point that you can like roll it up and put it in like a little poster. You're, tube. Right. We're not there yet, but <laughs> we're that is exactly where this is heading. I promise you. Yeah. I promise you. Yeah, so this kind of goes back to what I seen at CES 2015 and the fact that you know, you're going to have your display portion, what you do view everything on, and that is what stays on the wall. But from there, in this case with the this LG, you have this ribbon that comes out the bottom, mm -hmm. and then that kind of hooks into the TV's control panel, which is kind of a separate thing. It looks kind of like a sound bar. It's got all your inputs and outputs and some speakers and stuff like that. Everything that you would need to power the TV is in this separate unit, this modular unit that not only makes the TV super thin now, but it makes it look super minimalistic. It, you don't have that weird you know goofy stand that you gotta buy and bolt the dang thing to it and have to worry about it falling off the wall because it's too heavy or too light or whatever and, no. ima and imagine being able to just walk into a store and just buy this you don't have to call up your friend with a minivan or a pickup yeah you don't have to worry about it laying down and because it says, oh, don't ship laying down because it, you don't have to worry about it. It's going to come in a little sound bar box, and then you're going to get this nice little flat box. It's going to be like an inch or two thick. <laughs> right. It'll slide, and you don't have to worry about it if it's laying down or something like that. And it's going to be super light. You don't, you're not going to need two people to <laughs> lug this thing around. No. I, I mean, I would imagine that the sound bar portion could potentially weigh more than the screen itself. I'm sure it, it does. And, and one of the nice things about this is that, you know, if for, say, in two or three years, you're like, I'd really like to get something different. Well, if you stick with LG, for example, and it's got this ribbon, you just unhook the ribbon, you sell the old 
bar. We'll just call it the sound bar, and you upgrade to all the newer internals oh and stuff like that. You, you don't have to go buy. So essentially now what you're saying, this is modular, so you can keep your screen, and you just upgrade the components inside. Exactly. Instead of, oh, geez, so I've got to sell this whole big old thing, blah, 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 blah. So currently right now we're looking for a 4K TV. The one that keeps sticking out to me is the LG – OLED, the B6, the LG B6. Look it up. Fantastic reviews. Now, of course, I would love to have something like this, but I think that TV for us is still five, six years out. So to be what affordable. we're talking about now, yes. To be affordable. We'll probably stick to our what we're looking at now. Traditional. Tr- kind of traditional. And the next time we go to shop for a TV will be this form factor. I think this is going to overtake everything I think Samsung is going to finally switch to OLED TV because Sony brought out an OLED TV this year. They're like maybe like the second company to even do that. And actually our next story that it was a more of a tech demo Mm -hmm. that LG is doing. But Sony actually brought out a TV that does this. But what I'm actually talking about is a TV where you do not need speakers. It is uh, what they call crystal sound is what LG is calling it. And essentially, it takes the screen of the TV and uses it as a membrane to focus the sound out of of the TV screen. It, it I don't know how to explain it, it but essentially they had a, a TV that laid flat and they had beads on the uh, TV at CES so you could see them kind of bouncing and moving and projecting sound and it, it's just kind of it i can't quite wrap my head around them being able to project sound out of a tv and not distort picture or picture quality right because i mean that's one of the downsides i think of most modern tvs is it has down firing speakers mm-hmm. like the or they fire against the wall and then they fire out at you because of acoustics right so this is actually going to be completely front facing mm-hmm. so Again, it's kind of like the difference between a Nexus 6 and something else that's got a down firing. Or we could just use the iPhone 7 Plus to the iPhone 6S Plus, and you see the difference. You know, you get that little speaker at the bottom on the 6 line, and then now with the 7, 7 Plus, those are more front-facing. Yeah, it's uh, it makes a big difference in your audio setup because – with our current TV, which is still that TCL like 55, I think it is, those speakers shoot down, and which that, I'm not sitting underneath the TV. So you've got to crank it up a little bit higher unless I went out and got a sound bar, which I'm still thinking of doing because mm-hmm. I think it would be much, much better experience. Now, to clarify, LG's not the – this is not on in their product line this year. No. The, the – super thin one comes out in March. Yeah. This one is their kind of tech demo like, hey, look what we might do next year. Whereas Sony has the the new Bravia TV that, that does the same acoustic sound through the screen thing. Yeah, Bravia OLED TV. Right. That one does come out this year. So mm-hmm. Sony's jumping in with both feet. Mm-hmm. You know, back to that LG the let's see what is the actual name of this thing i'm gonna grab that real quick uh the the super thin one yes the lgw all right so that's kind of they call it the w series because the w stands for wallpaper and it wallpaper refer- window wow is what they said yeah <laughs> I kinda, I, it was corny but it, it makes sense I yeah guess. it's it's corny so if you, of course, like the majority of people, didn't get to go to CES this year, you will be able to check your local Best Buy store because they say a handful of Best Buy stores will be showcasing the TV and taking pre-orders starting January 5th, which on the day that we record this was yesterday. So pre-orders, we don't really know the amount that this thing's going to cost just yet. Oh, I imagine But it's going it, to be crazy. I imagine it's every bit of 7000 or up. It's going to be crazy. So, yeah. you audio-visual enthusiasts, get out there and buy you. this TV, please, because I want this to be a thing. This is for you. And they're also doing a 77-inch variant of this mm-hmm. thing. That's going to be oh god, that would be awesome. Eyes bleeding have. from your sockets. It's like, oh, it's so beautiful. Look at that. Yeah, just kind of some beautiful stuff. So kudos to LG. They also kind of announced a couple – you know, they never do their 
their LG G line of smartphones there, but they kind of right. showed off some of their more middling, middle level and lower mm-hmm. level devices. And actually, one of kind of the bigger things that I noticed throughout their um, whole press conference, lots of partnerships with Alexa, lots of partnerships with even Google Home stuff, uh, lots of choices for their customers. Actually, they added two more HDR you know, options to the TV. Uh, one is from Technicolor and the other, it's like HGL or something. I, I, I don't know enough about it because it's literally brand new and it's first time I've ever heard of it. So there's four HDR options in their TVs now, meaning you can buy their TV and it doesn't matter what component you buy, it will work. And that, that's, that's exactly what they want. Also, they put out a bunch of robots, which I thought were kind of, hmm. kind of cool. <laughs> You know, Amazon and Alexa, this is, seems to be a very hot topic now that, of course, Google is – they've released the Google Home, the little units. You've seen commercials for them. They've been talking about it for a while. So now you, Amazon has a true competitor for the Alexa. Well, it's not even really called the Alexa. Alexa is the quote-unquote OS, the virtual kind of person that you speak with that does all the behind-the-scenes things for the Echo. So Alexa – is now in all sorts of things because one of the things that Amazon has done right is that Alexa doesn't listen unless you command it to listen. Whereas Google, with Google Assistant, it seems to always be listening. And I think a lot of people with privacy concerns and stuff like that, they're like, I don't quite know so much about that. So it seems like more and more companies are kind of siding with Amazon yeah. and the Alexa because it seems to be a more – well, obviously, it's a little bit more established when it comes to this collaboration of, okay, Alexa and the Echo. That's been out kind of longer than Google Assistant and the Echo. Mm-hmm. So Amazon's kind of got the head start there. but And it seems to perform better from what, from what I've heard. It seems to perform better than Google's Assistant right now, which is interesting. Yeah, I mean, I but, never see. I never saw this coming. It was really interesting and it's really funny because a friend of ours, she's got. I know a few people that have the Amazon Echo, and when my dad was moving into his new condo a few weeks ago, you know, my friend lives right next to where he's moving, so I just said, "Hey, do you mind if I just crash at your place for a couple hours while I'm waiting on uh, the carpet people and stuff like this to come in and to drop the pot off, et cetera, et cetera." Because he was closing, and she's like, yeah, that's fine. So I go in, playing around with the dog, and I'm like, oh, that's right. She's got an Amazon Echo. Alexa, play the Beatles. And next thing you know, hey, there's music playing in the house. I'm like, yes, it's so awesome. I really regret not buying an Amazon Echo on Black Friday because <clears throat> the speakers on the thing, it, the Amazon Echo sounds wonderful. I feel, though, that... You could get a better speaker that also has Alexa for cheaper from one of the other manufacturers now. Well, I mean, that's kind of the thing where it's going to be going. Is Amazon going to be licensing that out or are they just going oh, to want absolutely. to continue to you have know, you buy? You know they want to do that because this is, the, this is the thing that, pardon the pun, is going to catch fire. Uh-huh. Unlike Amazon the phone. Fire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, all right, I will see myself out. <laughs> yeah. So kind of tying this back in with LG, which we just got done talking about, LG has or is releasing a quote-unquote smart refrigerator that has a 29-inch front touchscreen with something called InstaView, which is a door in door that can turn translucent and show you the contents of your fridge. It's pretty cool. It, it has a super wide angle lens so you can see everything in the entire fridge basically. And Keep up with your temperatures and I believe it's WebOS. It's either 3.0 or 2.0. I don't keep track of that too much, but it's their new WebOS. It's on yeah, their Web TVs. O- yeah. So Yeah, so that's kind of interesting. So you can kind of say, you know, Alexa, order more food or whatever, whatever it is that you would want to keep in that refrigerator. It keeps up with like a fresh tracker f- to keep track of food expiration dates. And you can just say, hey, send, you know, order that from my, you know, cart or whatever. Put that into my cart or whatever the case may be. Because it's connected to Amazon, we all, I mean, I would venture to say, if you're listening to this, you probably use Amazon. And I would imagine, yeah, the majority of people now are using 
Amazon. Ours renews here very shortly, and I I can't imagine not not renew. having it. Yeah, and it even showed us a kind of not a, a about a price point. They're like, you saved over a hundred dollars this year. We're using Amazon, and mm-hmm. it it sort of reassures you. That it's like, well, if you would have not had our Prime service you and you wanted to get those things from us, you would have had to pay all that extra shipping. Mm. But you also get all these features too. Yeah. So it's kind of coaxing. The music, the shows, the exactly. video streaming, the – yeah, everything that you get with it. It's like who would have thought Amazon, which originally kind of started out really as a book retailer in a way <laughs> yeah. to buy books <laughs> online and stuff like that. And now look at everything you can – you can do with it. It's like I thought about this actually on the drive home because I was listening to a, f- a recap of Frank Opinion Show again, another radio show here in the St. Louis area, and they were talking about that. And, you know, who would have thought Amazon would be what it is today? That it's so easy cannot be predicted. And the fact that you know, hey, it's been like ten, fifteen, twenty degrees here in St. Louis. They don't necessarily feel like running out to the store to get something. It's like, ah, I can wait a day or two for it to show up. I can just sit here and go on my phone while I'm sitting on the couch in a nice warm house watching TV. It's like, oh, that's right. I need to order blah, blah, blah. And there it is. Just wait till we, get, that, w- w- till we get the um, drone drop service and stuff or, like or that. the warehouse <laughs> around the St. Louis area yeah, it'll be where it's like, like one day. day shipping. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. I, I'll be broke. <laughs> that's what they want. Yeah, I'm Broke, fat, and lazy. <laughs> If they allow you to order beer, yes. Oh God, <laughs> God, beer, God have beer, mercy donuts, on me. pizza. Just order those three, or just order those three. Oh God. <laughs> yeah. So Alexa is kind of going everywhere. LG put Alexa into hub. It's smart home robot. Lenovo smart assistant is basically an Echo by a different name. Mattel's Aristotle is sort of like an Echo, but with features designed to help parents care for newborns. Bixie is making a portable. Puck with Alexa in it. I'm not sure what Bixie is. It sounds kind of like a one of those little bitty things. I guess you would say. I mean, if you look at it, it looks like a Nest thermostat, but I know that's not really what it is. Oh, okay. It lets you add gesture control to smartphones and smart home gadgets, and expected to ship in March after finishing its Kickstarter campaign in 2016. So they announced Bixie 2.0 at CES 2017. Uh, GE is presenting its LED ring lamp with, um, let's see, which is a kind of like what you would happen if you put in a halo. It looks on like an a echo dot. It looks like a Cortana symbol. Does it really? Yeah, it's it's oh my white, God. white, silver, blue on the inside. That's not even fair. <laughs> <laughs> and it kind of reminds me of the the little Dyson fans that oh, you can get. Uh-huh. That's and it's just like an oval. I mean, this is not an oval. This is a ring, but the Dyson fans. They have, they have rings exactly yeah. like that. Yeah. And you just look straight through it, and you're like, well, how is it heating? And I can feel it blowing on me <laughs> when there's, like, nothing that looks like it would be propelling the air towards you. Yeah, if somebody would have told me Alexa, the, this this new uh, a digital assistant from Amazon is going to be everywhere in 2017 CES, I would have said – I would have I would have laughed. laughed at you. I'd been yeah. like, no, it's going to be Cortana and it's going to be maybe Siri and it's going to be – well, not Siri because it's Apple. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's going to be uh, Google's assistant or whatever. Mm-hmm. And boy, am I wrong. Yeah. I mean Dish is integrating voice control through Alexa into its Hopper DVRs. Samsung's coming out with a Roomba. You know, vacuum competitor that's going to let you even be lazier and just yelling at an Echo device. ADT, the home security system, is going to be asking, or adding Alexa control to its pulse security system. And Linksys Velop router system is going to be supporting a handful of commands, including one that lets Alexa read your Wi-Fi password aloud. That, you know, whenever you have guests nuts. and stuff come yeah. over to your house, hey, what's your Wi-Fi password? And you just say, pfft. You don't have to do it. Alexa, what's my Wi-Fi password? Exactly. I still can't wrap my head around it. This is Amazon's big hit. This is their iPhone maybe. Yeah, which we all know how the uh, Amazon Fire phones or whatever they used to call them, those, their phones didn't kind of go over so well. They burnt out. Crashed and burned. <laughs> yeah, like literally. And we're going to wrap this up. By talking about Dell, which Dell, we all kind of know is more. I think Dell, 
I mean, it's still kind of popular in the home consumer categories, but we kind of think of Dell more so for enterprise and business. Well, I mean, for instance, the XPS 13 is rated as one of the best Ultrabooks you can buy right now Mm -hmm. for the money. I mean, they're definitely in the consumer space, but like you said, very much like a company focus. Yeah, I mean, they've gotten away from the dude. You got a Dell, or dude, it's a Dell. What oh, you know, that whatever that old old ad. I forgot about that from, from the old days of when it was Dell versus Gateway and the other, you know, HP. All these big computer companies really trying to battle it out. Hmm. Gateway was that a St. Louis based company? I don't know. It should have been, <laughs> or maybe yeah. it shouldn't have. Yeah, that's true. We wouldn't want to be associated with that. But the Dell XPS 27, yes, 27, Woo-hoo. is going to be bringing 10 speakers and a 4K Infinity Edge display to the desktop for creators. A ton of speakers. And it's going to be like, it's just more so for audiophiles, people that like to do a wide range of audio stuff so it's going to be kind of an entertainment computer in a way that's like an all-in-one it's got two tweeters four full range drivers two passive radiators which reinforce the lows packing the rich full sound of a large speaker into the sleek built-in design and provide the deep bass that you're looking for it's going to have a pair of independent down firing full range speakers which you know, we kind of already talked about down firing speakers and then some dynamic amplifiers Mm. So would you say that this is not necessarily a response to the Surface Studio, Studio, but yeah. sort of like their version of it? It's definitely their version. And again, this is where Microsoft and their Surface line, that's kind of a reference to say, hey, all of our OEMs, this is kind of what we're doing to innovate. Mm. You are free to copy our design. To Yeah, somewhat copy design because it, if you look at these images – it does kind of the same thing. It can, it lays down, and then the screen comes down at like a forty-something degree angle, or mm-hmm. whatever the angle. In is. fact, not completely related. Now that you mentioned that, Lenovo had a tablet this year that had that watch band sort of like on their um, two-in-one laptop that watch band hinge. Thing. Oh yes, they had that on a tablet. But the way the tablet would lay down and move, it was very reminiscent of a Surface Pro Four. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, I wonder where they got that idea from. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Lenovo has actually kind of had that, you know, kind of looks like in a way it's like a chain chain link. I love I I mean, they've done that for a while. Yes. Before it was just a couple little hinges, whereas, you know, the Surface Book, it kind of extended that across the entire width of the base. Right. Or the hinge, we'll say. Yeah, so this thing is going to be kind of set up. I mean, it's a little bit smaller. I can't remember off the top of my head the size of the Surface Studio display. But this is a 27-inch display and a lot more affordable you than know, I can't remember. the Surface Studio as right. well. Right. I believe it's about $1,000 less if I remember correctly. You can choose from either a 6th-gen Intel Core i5 6400 processor or a 6th-gen Intel Core i7 6700 processor. And let's see. Some of the memory options you have Anywhere from 8 to 32 gig SD RAM. And then there's four SO DIMM slots, which support an, support an additional 64 gig of memory. And you've got three graphics options, the Intel HD Graphics 530, an AMD R9 M47, M470X with 2 gig of GDDR5 RAM, and then an AMD R9 M485X with 4 gig of GDDR5 RAM. You've got a terabyte SATA hard drive, a 2 terabyte, and then you've got a combo drive which with a 2 terabyte SATA drive and then a 32 gig M.2 solid state drive with Intel RST. And then there's a 512 gig or 1 terabyte M2 PCIe SSD drive in there. So in comparison, the Surface Studio one terabyte Intel i5, eight gigabytes RAM. Uh, this starts at two ninety nine ninety nine. So, so we're looking 3, at almost 000. half price. Yeah, <laughs> and that's you know a twenty eight inch. You get an extra inch. Okay, mm-hmm. big deal. 
but it's but that Surface Studio display is beautiful. Oh, folks. I beautiful. Have nothing bad to say about it other than the price tag. Yeah, because if we could afford it, I bet it would be in here. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I think this is I think this is good. So they sort of price themselves out of the market, so they don't piss off their OEMs, OEMs yeah. and that, that's good because we don't want that. <laughs> like we want them working together and collaborating. But as Apple has proven that, you know, if you've got something that's beautiful enough and powerful enough, people will pay for it. Still, there's people they that just want the out. quote unquote very best. Yeah, they sold out of them. There, you know it. This, if you order one right now on Microsoft's website, it says it ships early 2017. That could mean from here till probably May. Yeah, anywhere within this first quarter of the year. So with Dell, the XPS 27, you can actually start ordering it today. Actually, as of yesterday, January 5th, and pricing, again, starts at 1500 and goes up depending on your hardware configuration. I like it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, this is for that stationary. If you don't need, let's say, that that very MacBook esque form factor, and you could just have a stationary thing with that much power and that much screen reality, this is what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Very, 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 very nice. I like this. And Dell is also refreshing the XPS 15 to give it larger battery, fingerprint reader, and a pretty darn powerful. GTX 1050 GPU. Yeah, this is this is pretty cool. In doing so much editing, I understand the need almost for a 15 inch uh, portable. If you know that's the kind of thing you want to carry around and, and edit on, I have two screens at home that might work for me better. But again, you know, if I'm doing the portable thing, this would be something I would definitely look at. Well, I mean, in a, in a way, you know, it's. One of the advantages is that you can save a master file on your desktop and upload it to your cloud and then access it on the go if you're like, hey, I've got some time to go to the office and get some editing done there. I can get it done on a reasonably sized machine. Yeah. I I still really personally, for personal reasons, love the 13, 14 inch. I think that's perfect. And the 15 has always seemed just a little too big, which is funny because – you know, back in the day, everybody wanted a 17-inch laptop. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> I mean, you can get an initial nine, or well, let's say, this is initially a thousand-dollar laptop, and you can get that with a non-dedicated GPU and a full HD non-touch display with a dual-core i3 CPU. But you can really kind of load this thing out and get some serious, serious hardware in this thing. I mean, you can get either. 8 gig, 16 or 32 gig RAM options. You've got a bunch of different storage options. A lot of that combination. Three different CPU choices, the i3, i5, or i7, dedicated graphics, or just built in Intel HD630, or the previously mentioned NVIDIA GeForce GTX 1050 with, with 4 gig of GDDR5. That's the RAM. one I would recommend. Oh, yeah. yeah if, you could at least kind of play some games on the go, too, yeah, if you want. Yeah, you can get some stuff done on that. That's nice. So if you want to max this thing out, you're looking at 2650, but that's still a lot cheaper than that 15 inch uh -huh. MacBook Pro with the little touch bar. <sighs> Not going to go there. <laughs> so, I mean, again, pricing starts at $999 all the way up to $2650. So if you're looking for that, availability has not yet been announced. I would imagine that it would, you know, come March, then, April. Yeah. It's, it's going to be Back about, to school. Yeah, about the time that school is getting ready to wrap up and people are looking to give your graduates a nice mm -hmm. graduation gift. There you go. There you go. Get ready for school, folks. Hard to believe. You know, that it's funny. Um, when I was graduating high school – my dad had asked me, since I knew what I was going to do, he's like, well, do you want tools or do you want, you know, a, a computer? I'm like, I want a computer. I don't yeah. have one. <laughs> so I got my very first computer, and guess what? It was a Dell. Mm -hmm. so. Dude, it's a Dell. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, folks, Samsung. Just kind of a, a little brief thing. We don't really want to get too much into everything. Cause, yeah, yeah, these next three are probably – kind of short yeah pretty pretty short samsung has announced that they have sold five million gear vr mobile headsets that's a lot of mobile headsets 
that's pretty close to about how many watches Apple has sold. So that's kind of impressive. I mean, if you factor in this and, th- and think about this, I mean, Samsung hasn't really, quote unquote, sold them. They've given a bunch away with like the S7 and the S7 Edge. And, and that's actually exactly what I was about to ask. Yeah, because they've given a lot of them away to just try to flood the market as much as they can. Well, that was what came with most people's devices when they bought their phone right when it came out. That was like a, you know, a, a short run of buy the phone, you get the headset for free. Right. And because obviously the Gear VR only works with Samsung Galaxy devices. Right. And it kind of benefits them in that respect. It's like I believe they partnered with Oculus with these to kind of help give it um, the best quality they could for a, you know a phone sticking on your face. And I think that's really it's good. It's because it's introducing a lot of people to you know the VR platform and things that they can watch and things they can kind of interact with and all that stuff. So that's that's good. It's helping build the VR AR industry, and that's a good thing because yeah. there's a lot of stuff. That, CS 2017, I think it was kind of related to the VR and stuff like that. Uh, Sony has also sold many hundreds of thousands and surpassed their initial expectations of PlayStation VR. So that's good. Again, I think that's a version kinda... 2 of that would be better with more mm-hmm. updated controlling yeah, hardware. Also, uh, um, the the screen in it. So you don't get that screen door effect. And what what I mean by screen door effect is when you look through a screen door and you have those lines that you see, I think an upgraded version of that would eliminate that, get it, you know, a much higher res. I think the only way to do that is to just have new newer hardware. I don't know if they still call it the PS4 or whatever, whatever they call it. It's the same reason the Scorpio is going to exist. So Right. <laughs> As we mentioned earlier, we talked a little bit about Qualcomm and the Snapdragon 835 CPU, which is going to be supercharging mobile VR and AR devices. Now, again, this is just, you know, when people think Snapdragon, uh, this is a nice mobile processor that's going to work in smartphones. Well, this 835 is not just going to be in smartphones. It's actually going to be in some of these standalone VR AR headsets that you're going to be seeing from a variety of companies like Intel and all these other. And for the first time, Mm -hmm. it's going to run Windows 10. What? 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 Oh, my. This. I'm so excited for this. Yes. Mainly because no one can touch snapdragon right now they are kind of in an unstoppable juggernaut when it comes to you know mobile chipsets mm-hmm. and they are kind of the pinnacle they're the intel of the mobile world which is bad for intel but it's kind of what happens when uh, you it's can't you lose yeah exactly so when Ask you... blackberry <laughs> <laughs> or Nokia. The 835 is improving visual fidelity by up to 25%. Adds in a foveated rendering support 10-bit display with 16-time improvement in the number of colors that you're going to see. Improved signal-to-noise ratio D3D. Special audio support. Reduced motion to photon latency. Six degrees of freedom and integrated Wi-Fi support. So that's kind of nice. Going to be seeing these in devices coming out very soon. Hopefully, 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 the LG G6. Yeah. If LG doesn't put that in their device, then you might as well just stop. Stay with what I have. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I'm yeah, I'm almost betting it's going to be in there. I really, really hope so. Yeah. I can't wait this. Well, evening. you're going to – you have to consider it's pretty much going to be every Samsung device other than the ones that use their Exynos chips or whatever, yeah. which, again, that's a global market thing. Certain areas get this. Right, right. So, yeah, pretty much the Galaxy S8 will have that, S8 Edge, whatever. Probably. However it is that Samsung decides to go in 2017. The, the Note or not Note, whatever they decide to whatever, do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're just going to sweep the Note name under the rug. Who knows? I, I think the most exciting part about this is Windows 10. I mean, I can't imagine Windows running on something other than, well, Intel for me. Yeah. I personally like Intel for uh, Windows 10. But if this does it just as good, if not better, for those cheaper, lesser devices, and not, not necessarily lesser, but something that you could still get work done, mm-hmm. I, th- I find that fascinating because yeah. Intel is kind of expensive. Yeah. I mean this is going to be in dedicated VR headsets, tablets, and PCs as well. The device will support Google's operating system, so previously mentioned Android, and then, of course, Chrome OS. 
as well as full Windows 10 and all legacy Win32 applications. Yeah, because if you think about it, if Intel is stopping their mobile chipset, Microsoft has to do this. They mm-hmm. have to support this chip so they can have a mobile processor. There's just no way around yeah. that and in this I mean, day and age. It's kind of like we talked about a few weeks ago that – All this Windows and stuff like that really coming to more mobile devices as true Windows 10, not this Windows mobile OS. Right. So it's kind of kind of leads to all of that stuff. The last thing on the list is a company, little company called the Faraday Future, which a lot of people would like to say that they are kind of Tesla's. You know, competition, I guess. Right. Which, maybe, but that remains to be seen as their newest car, the FF91, doesn't come out till next year. Now, it sports a 130 kilowatt hour battery pack, which is about 30 more than Tesla's biggest battery pack, and it it's about a thousand five or a thousand fifty horsepower, which is yeah, just that's insane. Of, that's a lot of horsepower, folks. All wheel drive. It will have. It's all wheel drive. It is uh, more of a form factor, closer to the Model X. They're they're um, more of a SUV. SUV style, even though it does look like a sedan. In Maybe a, way. a crossover, if you will. But it has a range of 378 miles, which is incredible. Now, I would imagine that this will also be priced similar to like a Model S or X. So don't expect this to be a run out and get. Thirty, forty thousand dollar car for most of us. This is going to cost you a pretty penny, I would imagine. Um, this is a startup company from China, I believe, and most of their stuff has kind of just been vaporware up to this point. But this is supposedly their design for their next car, which will again supposedly come out next year. Now, if all that rings true, that's fantastic because that's going to, you know, kick the rest of the industry into gear. Now that more and more car companies are heading in that direction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's going to be um, very interesting to see how this kind of goes. I'm not really too keen on the design of this thing. It's okay. Visually. Yeah, it's okay. But then again, if it's like all these quote-unquote concept style things, you typically you look at it and you go, eh. Yeah, you want to see a real goofy car. Look at Toyota's new i something or another that they showed off at ces it's extremely way way out in left field kind of thing kind of like that mercedes from two years ago that yes. silver concoction yeah just real goofy and weird for the sake of it i think um just to see how strange they can make it maybe but faraday future not so much a competitor to Tesla, more a competitor to the rest of the industry, I say. Everyone keeps saying, oh, they could destroy Tesla. They could do this. They could do that. Well, number one, they don't have a car out. So there's that. And number two, this car needs to come out for that to even happen. I, w- I would say reserve judgment, maybe be cautiously optimistic. But I see them being more of a threat to the rest of the auto industry that already exists because if you're not into electric cars by now, there's a very real possibility you might disappear in five years. Very, very true. Yeah. And again, like with all things that we talked about in the CES segment, the link to this is going to be from Engadget and it's going to be in the show notes and there's a few different GIFs, uh, short little videos and stuff Mm -hmm. like that looking at this. And one of the things that kind of stands out to me here real quick is the fact that they show the car just like doing a from sudden stop accelerating off you know exit stage right kind of thing and i'm sitting there thinking man that's a very risky venture to do something like that in a room full of people because if something would have went wrong that would have ruined the company pretty much yeah in fact (laughs) they tried to do a tech demo of the self-parking self-driving stuff on stage and it didn't go so well it didn't hurt anybody. It didn't do anything funny. It just didn't work. And I think they tried to attribute that to it not having a good connection to like all the satellites and you know because it's inside a building. Exactly. And like exactly. That, yeah. Terrible building penetration. Yeah, I guess you know. I guess that could be a thing. But I think if you're a true self-driving car, you would still be able to, in quotation, see what it is doing and be able to still park or whatever itself. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So that kind of does it for our CES segment of this episode. We'd like to know what it is that you've seen from CES, whether you just seen it online or if you got to go to CES this year. What stood out to you? What are you excited about? What do you want to see make it into next year Mm -hmm. and beyond? Let us know. Yeah, you can do that. Email contact at thetechinformist.com on Twitter at Tech Informist and on Facebook, if you'd like, I'm sure if you just do a quick little search for Tech Informers, you'll find it on Facebook as well. So let us know. We would love to know what you think about CES 2017, some of the things that came out and some of the things you might have just seen. And we're like, what in the hell was that? Because there is always that. Uh, just real quick thing on that as well. I saw Marquez Brownlee, MKBHD on Twitter and YouTube. He shared out a picture of the... Asian gentleman that is always there. I think he called him Dr. Fuji, and I seen this group there in 2015. There are these like little vibrating scale looking like things and just really bright neon colors and stuff, and I'm like, yep, guys, they're still there again. They just keep coming back and spending money to be at CES. And he's like dancing on them like, oh my god. Back again. Back again. Twenty seventeen, it's time for more app and entertainment picks. And on this week's episode, we've got a couple shows. One from Brad, one from myself, and I'm gonna let Brad talk about his first and show. Both uh are from Netflix. Netflix, yeah. Both so, Netflix shows. So if you're a Netflix subscriber, you can watch both of them right now. And I would imagine all of you are. So without further ado, I would like to mention that I have finally got around to watching Black Mirror. For whatever reason, if you have not seen Black Mirror and you are really big into tech or sci-fi, you really need to look and watch this. You, you just drop whatever it is you're doing after the show, obviously, and uh, go watch Black Mirror. It is like somebody took X-Files in the Twilight Zone and shoved them together. It takes a tech concept that could you know, potentially be real in the future and maybe shows the darker side of what the social implications of of us making this thing could be or or situation could be and it really takes them to a dark place so this isn't really a show for kids at all but it definitely definitely a thriller lots of sci-fi kind of angles i really really have enjoyed it the one episode that i've liked the most so far was the one with john ham in it so when you see john ham you know you will be in for a very very good episode yeah. It seems kind of like the release schedule for this is very hit and miss. It's very all over the place. It's I like, think it's just now getting traction, so I would see probably a more consistent, consistent release schedule. So uh, the first uh, season was only like three episodes back in 2011, and I can't remember then beyond that. It looks like season two was three episodes in 2013, early 2013. And then one episode in 2014, there was like a year or something between season two, episode one, two, and three. So that's February 11th, February 18th, February 25th, 2013. And then season two, episode four came out December 16th of 2014, according to IMDb. So the guy that writes this, I'm not extremely familiar with him, but uh, Charlie Brooker is the writer he just – he really does a fantastic job. He writes he, – and despite the themes of the, the, um, the show, he loves tech and he, he loves um, you know just kind of watching tech from afar uh, as a writer I suppose. And I think the reason he wants to write these is to sort of in – maybe in the same way that The Matrix might have been written is to kind of put that little seed in the back of your brain like, hey, these are the social implications that could happen. Not necessarily will but could. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'll have to check that out. So recently, my wife and myself were just kind of looking for something new to watch. And this is a Netflix original series called Travelers. And let's see, I'm trying to think when it actually released. It looks 2006? like 2006? Or no. 2016, rather? Yeah, it just, I mean, it just came out. So, see, season one. I think October. it just it all just dropped back in. No, it just dropped... November? 
Uh, it's kind of all over the place, it looks like. <laughs> but anyway, I mean, they just release everything at once. It's, I mean, that's how Netflix does things. So the premise of Travelers is reading it just directly from IMDb. Hundreds of years from now, surviving humans discover how to send consciousness back through time into people of the 21st century. These travelers assume the lives of others while attempting to save humanity from a terrible future. Oh, so it's that's what Elon Musk is. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. so we've watched the entire 12 episodes. I'm jonesing for more, so I'm hopefully they come out with this a little bit sooner than later. Question. Have you seen Stranger Things? I've only seen three or four episodes. Would you find this more interesting than Stranger Things for right? Like for me and my interest, yes. Okay, I guess once you finish Stranger Things, I would be curious to see if you still like this more. Mm -hmm. I'm already interested once again because it's sci-fi. I love sci-fi; just absolutely love it. So I'm definitely very curious now. Yeah. So on IMDb, this has an eight point one out of ten. A cumulative rating out of 5,800 reviews or ratings, we'll say. And it is it is really, really good. I mean, there's just a number, number of characters. The show opens in episode one, kind of introducing you to each character and what their quote-unquote host body is, you know, what they are. Um, Marcy, her character is... She's a librarian. She's got special needs. She's got like a brain development issue where she can't really – she's got speech is, issues and stuff like that. And then you've got another who is a heroin addict and then another guy. He was a high school – I guess he's a high school senior. He was a football player. He's into MMA and stuff like that. And then you've got another character. She's just a kind of a, a mom, an unmarried mom mm -hmm. uh, with a husband who's a police officer. And then there's this detective that's noticing all these strange things on the dark web. And he's like, okay, so we got to investigate what all these messages mean, stuff like that. It's just really, it's really well done, I think. Along the lines of ratings and stuff, just to give you context of Black Mirror, they're at an 8.9 out of 96,000 reviews. Nice. So it kind of. Apparently people like that. Show. People really like it. And again, it is not for everyone. I'm not saying that it's the best thing ever. I'm just saying. With that in mind, maybe check it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so definitely check out. These will both be in the show notes. If you forget it, mm -hmm. just remember, come to our site and check it out. Yeah, I, th I think one of the nice things about the Traveler series to me is the fact that it's just a bunch of actors and actresses that I was personally not familiar with. And then going back in IMDb to see what people have actually been in, Mackenzie Porter, who plays Marcy, you might remember her from – she was on Hell on Wheels. And let's see. So she was been on a show called Blackstone. She was on Supernatural for a little bit. Oh, I guess I did also forget to mention um, whereas yours is at one full single story. These are – on in Black Mirror – are all separate stories to themselves. They do not connect whatsoever. They're just completely separate stories. So that, that's why I would say it's very like X Fi or not X Files, very um, Twilight Zone esque. Right, because I mean Twilight Zone was. I mean, there's like a common theme. Exactly. But each episode was a story in and of itself. Yes. And I kind of like. That I kinda love stuff. that stuff. I really do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I'm all about the time travel and stuff like that. That always kind of interests me. So, oh yeah, that was one of the things that attracted me to travelers in the first place. Doctor was, Who. I mean, just saying, Doctor Who. Yeah. First off, I would like to congratulate Brad on making his one thousandth individual beer that he and that was in. before the new year. So and he, ha. Did it. he made it, but he's got a beer pick of. The week, and I will let him talk about it. So, in the road to that, I went to a local um, place that you know that, that that's what they do. You can just go in, pick any beer off the shelf out of any pack, put it in your own pack, and make your own four pack, six pack, twelve pack, whatever. It, it doesn't matter. It's the craft beer seller over in Clayton. If you're in the St. Louis area, I highly suggest you stop in and check it out. Also. If you mention my name, Brad Whiteside, in the computer, um, I get a little credit. Like a little rewards points. Yeah, kind of exactly. I get a little credit, and so do you. So maybe 
do that. But you can also sample beers that they have on tap there too. So, I mean, it's kind of everything all wrapped up into one. It's really nice place, but the, I picked up this beer from there. It is a blueberry maple stout from Sawtucket Brewing Company. Sagatuck. Sagatuck. See? Yeah. This Which is, is what you're actually, here for. Actually, I, I can't remember if we had the Neapolitan Milk Stout as a beer pick of the week. We did. Uh, I Same would say, brewing company. Just a couple uh, weeks ago. No way. Yep, same okay. Company. So we've, we've come full circle. I actually finally had that as well uh, right before this, actually. Mm. But uh, basically, I mean, when you are when you pour it, it's it's definitely a stout, you know, through and through. It's, it's just black as night. But the smell is like blueberry pancakes. It just kicks you in the face with that very blueberry kind of bready, pancakey mapleness goodness, and you know it's a sweet milk stout. So it, it, not sweet as in like Smirnoff sweet, but sweet no, yeah. enough that it just has that little little bit, and um, and then it just just kind of finishes with the maple, and then at the very end you kind of get that aftertaste of the stout. And oh, it's 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 very interesting but it's it's a good it's a good brew it's six percent abv 26 ibus so not very bitter at all obviously because it's a sweet milk stout i believe i gave it at least a 4.0 hang on a second which would be pretty consistent because it's got an, a composite rating of over eighteen thousand one hundred and thirteen ratings of three point eight one so yeah so i did give it a 4.0 i i just felt that if i saw that on tap i'd be like I want to try that on tap. That mm-hmm. that would be a good beer to have right now. So, kind of a dessert beer even. So. Yeah. So that does it for this episode, which is 159 of the Tech Informist. We hope that you have enjoyed it. Please, again, make sure to reach out to us on via email or social media or whatever way that you would like to. That's contact at thetechinformist.com. We also have the website, techinformist.com, and Twitter, at techinformist. You can always find me on Twitter. That's kind of where I love to be, everybody. So, at Kevin Harvell with two L's. And then, of course, Brad can be found on Twitter at... Holy underscore shadows. Yes. And basically everywhere across the web as that, or yeah. some variant. Right. So, whether it's Instagram or Twitter or Xbox Live, stuff like that. We are trying some different things with the show Uh, we hope that you will grow to like them um our almost parent company yeah we're going to be kind of tweaking some things and kind of making things a little bit more closer to what yeah what we find uh with other shows on the network that we're considering bringing the show to so you -hmm. will actually be hearing a lot more about that and probably be hearing about more shows during little segments of this show as well in the hopefully not too distant future new year somewhat new show yeah but we'll keep things familiar enough that you will not be too out of sorts so thank you all to everybody who has been an existing listener and longtime listeners and also welcome to all of those of you that are new to the show so again this has been the tech informist i'm kevin i'm brad and until next time consider yourself informed we're out of here see ya